So let's give David Johnson a great big hand as he comes to share with us what the Lord has laid on his heart. Hallelujah. It's called OJT, on-the-job training, you know. Sometimes you just learn by doing. Bless you, brother. Nick makes it easy to follow him. Um, I told him this before in private. I'll tell him in public. I've heard Kerry Job. I've heard Hillsong. I still think he's probably one of the best, if not the best, worship leaders there is. And I know he hates me putting him on the spot. Um, I thank all the band, uh, Commander Philip, who was a uh, Taylor, who just sat down, Noah and Steve, who help us out a lot, and Ben, who helps me out with the sound. Um, my other sound guy, who normally helps me, he is out of town. And so I was at 550 wondering who's going to do sound for me, but thankfully Sister Henrietta was here. And uh, Savannah, who also helps us with the PowerPoint and helped us out with the sound. Um, as well as Brother Baker, he's the one that does our live stream. Um, all the live stream stuff would not be possible without him, and I thank him for that. Um, I thank Pastor for letting me preach. And, you know, he talked about technology stuff. Um, it is a headache sometimes doing the sound stuff. Uh, Nick tells me every Sunday, David, you don't know how much you helped me. Um, and Tuesday night I had to work during the revival and Nick got here with everybody brought their stuff from Stantonsburg and About 530 no one else from the sound stuff is here yet Nick's the only one and Nick is running around wondering what in order to do because he did not realize exactly how much stress you can get But thankfully it all worked out because God is good um, I know we kind of died down but uh We've clapped for me, we've clapped for everybody else, but I think we need to stand up and give God a, a standing ovation because, because of who he is. I mean, where would you be without God? Where would you be without Christ? Um, now, okay, all right, hold on, hold on, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Now, y'all do a lot better than that at ball games. Let's try, okay, all right. Stand up one more time. Come on. Look. We're Pentecostal. Now, we're supposed to be the ones that are hooping and hollering and shouting, praising God. Let's try it one more time and give God a clap of praise. I hope y'all sound good. Whew. Okay. Mm. I feel like running. I, I ain't never run before in church. I might be first time tonight. <clears throat> Speaking of running, um, my dad's here. He's sitting over here on the left. Um, I'm thankful for a pastor who both preaches in the pulpit, but he also preaches at lunch because he gives me ideas for sermons that he doesn't even know about, and half of the stuff that I think about preaching, he's already said. He just says it in another way. So I kind of borrow thoughts from him. And tonight my message is called Stop Me. Um, stop me. It's, it's a, a, an analogy for four types of attitudes that can stop you as a Christian. Um, I told Pastor Nick at lunch that I was going to try to limit myself to 25 minutes. Um, if you know me, you know I love to talk. So we're just going to let God do what he does and see what happens. Um, but <clears throat> in life, there are many things that will stop you. Uh, people, problems, situations, friends, family, so on and so forth. And <clears throat> from the last time I preached to today, a lot's going on. Um, finished my first semester of college, learned that if you're a college student, you both eat a lot of fast food. Even though you have a job, you spend a lot of money. Um, you, yeah. Um, and you don't get a lot of sleep because by the time you get home from work, by the time you get done with church stuff, you do your homework, it's 12 o'clock at night. So um, my roommate is, his name is David. He's Korean by birth, but he's from Australia. So a years-long relationship with him has been the most interesting thing I've ever learned in my life because he looks like he ha should have an Asian accent, but he has a perfectly Australian accent which messes with your mind. Especially since now that I hang around with most of my friends are the international students uh, from Venezuela and everywhere else. So my English is 
really bad sometimes. Um, I have a southern accent in the first place, so hearing accents from all over the world, you learn different words. Um, and one funny story before I get into my message. Uh, the first week that David and I were roommates, um, I learned just how different English is across the world. Um, I wake up about 6.30. We have a class at 8 o'clock, and he's awake before I am, and he's moving around, and he says, hey, mate, Dave, he never calls me David. He always calls me Dave. He says, Dave, can you hand me my thongs? Now, I'm half asleep, and I'm laying away from him. Don't, don't worry. It's not what you think. Just bear with me. And so I act like I'm asleep still. He says it again. I turn and look at him. He says, oh, I'm sorry, my sandals, my flip-flops. What do you call them? In Australia, they call flip-flops thongs. Um, so that was the first experience that I had with an Australian person. Yeah, I don't know if I want to visit Hillsong in Australia anymore. But um, anyway, so <clears throat> but like I said, there's a lot of things in life that stop you and hinder you. And uh, a lot of times as Christians, we'll cry out and call out to God and say, you know, Lord, why? Why me? Why me? What, what have I done? How do I get out of this? You know, God, fix it. God, fix it. But a lot of the times, the things that stop us, God never puts on us in the first place. It's our own stupidity. It's our own actions that put oppression and things that stop us on us. And a lot of times in churches, we've, we've had this formula of if I sin, I go to the altar, I cry a little bit, I cry out, God, forgive me. I walk out five, ten days later, I do the same thing, and it's a repeating cycle. When in reality, God never called you to be a, re a repeat. He called you to be a revived. And the thing is, the first attitude is the stupid me. Um, I don't have a text for tonight, but I have just several examples in the Bible. Uh, the first one is in Gen Genesis 19, 17 through 26. That's a lot of verses, and when my voice will not allow me to read all of it. But basically, it's the story of Lot. Um, and Lot and his wife and, and his people and his family were in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he, he as an individual, loved God and sought God, but the city as a whole was wicked and horrible. Um, <clears throat> and why that's important is the fact that in this life, in this day and age, we may live for Christ, but our city and our country is in shambles. It's horrible. Um, even in our churches. And I've learned another thing that the church people are probably some of the most hateful people you'll ever meet in your life. And I know that's hard to say, but it's true. Because I've grown up in church, and some of the most horrible things that people have said about me or said towards me about other people was in the church. During service, we're singing, how great is our God, but we're saying, ooh, you see what she's wearing? You know, and, and I don't understand people because I love people, don't get me wrong, but sometimes I love them really, really strained, and, <clears throat> and a lot of times the, the stupid me attitude comes into play, where you do something, you say, oh, that was stupid of me, or, oh, um, you know, I, I messed up and, and whatever, and you're like, oh, man, that was stupid. Um, and Lot had one of those moments. Um, actually, Lot's wife had one of those moments, uh, big correction. Um, in the story, the angels come and say, hey, you know, get out of town, leave, move, because we're about to destroy the city. And Lot says, oh, Lord, no, 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 I can't run away, because where I, where I will have to go, I'll be destroyed. And a side note about this is the fact that in the story, Lot says in verse 22, or actually the angels say this in 22, Make haste and take refuge there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar, which means little. The fact that an angel or God cannot do anything according to the movement of a man is powerful because that both also that empowers you to realize that if you move with God he moves on your behalf but if you move against God 
you're going to run into a brick wall that you're not going to tear down. Just like Pastor always says, God's, you don't break God's laws. God's laws break you. And that truth is so evident in, in today's culture, especially with my generation, because my generation tends to have a, a theory that God loves me so I can do anything. Which God does love you, but that doesn't mean you can do anything. And even in my own life, I thought that, and I was taught that, not by my parents, not by my church, but by my own mind. Um, you know, there's a lot of things in my life that I've done that I've realized that God loves me, loves me, loves me, loves me. But because I've sown bad things, I've had to reap some, reap some benefits and also some bad things from that. Um, one of the things that you'll learn as you get older, even though I'm only 18, I feel old compared to some people because some of the things people younger than me are talking about, I don't even have a clue what they are. Um, but one of the things you'll learn is that the, the greater you get into God, the greater the attack will be. And the more moments you'll have to make decisions, and you'll make the right or wrong decision. And if you try to do it in your own human understanding, you'll make the wrong decision. If you try to do it in your own thinking, your own intellectual power, you'll always make the stupid decision. You'll always make the wrong choice. And that's exactly what Sarah did. Or not Sarah. Lord, I don't know why I thought about Sarah. Anyway, <coughs> Lot's wife. Um, I don't think he, her name is even in this, actually. Anyway, um, but later on in the story, when Sodom and Gomorrah is about to be destroyed and they get out of town, they're running. And the angel gives them one direction, one instruction. Just run and don't look back. That's it. Nothing else. You don't have to fight anything. Just run and don't look back. Everybody's running. And the city's about to be destroyed. And Lot's wife turns around and looks back. And she turns into a pillar of salt. And I believe before she did, she realized, oh, stupid me. David had a, one of those moments with Bathsheba, and he realized after he had done all that, and Nathan said, you know, this man had a sheep. He only had one sheep, and his rich guy took his sheep because he wanted his sheep. And David said, kill him. Nathan said, that's you. And David realized, stupid me. And I think in life that that's the, begins the cycle of, of what stops you is you have a stupid moment. Because stupidity sometimes leads to temptation. Um, you become tempted because you make a dumb decision. You put yourself in the wrong place, and you become tempted. You become vulnerable to an attack, and you become vulnerable to what the enemy would want to do against you. Um, James 1, 10 through 15 says, And the rich person ought to glory in being humbled, because like the flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun comes up with a scorching heat and parches the grass. Its flower fails off, falls off and its beauty fades away. Even so will the rich man wither and die in the midst of his pursuits. But blessed is the man who is patient under trial and stands up under temptation. For when he has stood the test and been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted from God, for God is incapable of being tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But every person is tempted when he is drawn away, enticed and baited by his own evil desires. Then the evil desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin when fully matured, brings death. No matter who you are, we're all tempted. And the point is, in reality, most of us who are in this room are saved because most church people are saved. Or at least they claim to be saved. But that's a whole other sermon. We're no different from a non-believer except by the fact that we realize that sin is wrong. A non-believer has no moral, spiritual guide because they simply don't care. But they're also ignorant to it. But we're not because we've been saved by grace. So we realize that what we do when we get into a stupid situation and become tempted, we realize that it's wrong. If you think it's a temptation, 
it's probably wrong. It's if if you think it is, it probably is. And the biggest part about this is the fact that even though even good things can be temptations, even eating too much or or working out too much, that be, can become an idol, that can become a god. Having money is not a wrong thing, but you know, the Bible says the the root of all evil is the love of money. You know, and I feel that the church today has become accustomed to settling for the good things when we have access to the God things because we get access to good preachers, good messages, good music, good good sermons, good powerful things, but we don't get access we don't take the ac- the access to the God things which are the healings, miracles, sights and wonders, the abundant life that we have, the victorious living that we can have in Christ and that is a problem because when you settle for the good, you have a chance to be oppressed. And that's my third point, that you become from stupidity to tempted to oppressed. Because when you fall into temptation, you become oppressed by both the enemy, by your own guilt, by your own shame, by your own feelings. David said in Psalms 119, 134, and 135, Deliver me from the oppression of man, so I I will keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statues. Um, There's two kinds of oppression, the ones that you put on yourself and the ones that man or, or the enemy puts on you, things that are outside and things that are inside. When you do something stupid on your own, obviously, That's you oppressing yourself because you walked into something that you knew good and well you shouldn't have walked into. But the the kind of oppression that I want to deal with tonight, and this is where I want to stay the longest, and this is really what what hit me on the sermon, is in Luke 8, 43 through 48, it talks about the woman who suffered with the issue of blood. And verse 43, she spent all that she had upon doctors. Everything she had, she spent. So you've got a woman who's dealt with the issue of blood. She's weak physically. She's broke financially. She's defeated spiritually. Mentally, she's exhausted. And the only thing that she has left is desperation. She's oppressed, but she's desperate. And there's light in the fact that No matter how oppressed you get, if you get desperate enough to find Jesus, your desperation for God would turn him. And as soon as she touched the hem of his garment, he turned. There's something powerful about when God turns. Because when God turns, everything else moves. When God turns around, he sees the faith He sees the desperation of what she wanted, what she needed. Not only did he heal her physically, I honestly believe that everything else come back to her. The Bible doesn't say. If it does, I didn't read any farther into it. But in verse 47, and when the woman saw that she had no escaped, not escape her notice. She came up trembling and falling down before him. She declared in the presence of all the people for what reason she had touched him and how she had been instantly cured. And Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go into peace. And I think we've become into a situation where we understand that oppression and temptation and, and, and stupidity, that's all bad things, but in reality, the longer you, be, you become oppressed, the harder the situation looks to get out of, and you become in a state of pitiful me, which is the last one. You become pitiful. You become disheartened. You don't want to do anything. You don't want to go to church. You don't want to get up and sing. You don't want to lift your hands in church. You don't want to praise God. You don't want to say Bible verses. You don't want to read. You don't want to pray in your quiet time. The very things that will get you out of the situation are the things that you don't feel 
are able to do. And there was a point in my life where I had gotten saved when I was at a youth conference when I was 14. And during that conference, um, I got through, I got over a lot of stuff, a lot of, a lot of mental heartache. And throughout the time since then till now, a lot of things have happened. And there was a point when I was 16 that mom and daddy had gone to a, a, a service and it was me and my dog in the house. Side note, that's the most adorned dog you'll ever meet in your life. I think he knows how to pray sometimes. Sometimes I believe he knows how to speak in tongues. I don't know. But he'll bark sometimes. Anyway, but I was in the middle of, of, a, of a state of depression and not anxiety, but just feeling really down. And I put a smile on my face and I'd walk around, you know, hey, brother, hey, sister, you know. I'd sing all the songs at church and go to school. Everything's fine. And that night I was sitting in the living room and the enemy is saying, just end it all. This is the lowest part I've ever been in my life. And I never thought that I would have thoughts of suicide. I never thought that growing up in church and hearing about the love of Christ, I would feel the need to end my own life. And I hope that you're okay with it. Even if you're not, you have to deal with it anyway. But I believe that preachers need to start being more open about what they deal with. You don't need to tell all the details of what you did with who. But I think you, people need to be more open, especially with our generation, because we're so accustomed to seeing things that are violent and graphic and intense that if we just say, oh, Jesus loves you, we, we tune it out the minute you say it. But if you're up in our face and you get down on our level and you step down to where we're at, and we see that even though you're preaching, you're still struggling sometimes. Even though you're preaching, you're still going through some things. You don't have it all together. That, let, that gives us hope that even though we don't have it together and you don't have it together, you know somebody that does. Because what you're preaching about makes it more real. It becomes a lot more alive when the person who's saying Jesus loves them is dealing with feeling that they're unloved. It's a lot stronger when somebody says that God is able to get you out when you're get it being God out yourself. And so when I was in that state, the, the enemy's saying, you know, David, end it all, end it all. And honestly, it was close. And this is the moment that changed my life forever that I know that God is real and that God still moves and speaks nothing can shake my faith anymore because of this and I had my I actually had my knife in my hand and I had it on my throat and I wrote a note to my mom and dad telling them I love them I told Cody my dog that I love him and he's sitting there wagging his tail at me and I was sitting on the couch saying, okay, one time, and it's done. As a matter of fact, it's not this knife. I'm not going to open it. But there's two reasons I carry a pocket knife. One, because I grew up in Rangers, and it's a tool. But two, as a reminder that it didn't defeat me. Because it's on my neck, and I cannot move my hand. And Daddy, whenever he, whenever he tells me to do something and I don't listen, he never hits me. He never does anything to hurt me. But he has a strong grip. My dad has a very strong grip, and I don't mess with him. Because he will beat my tail if he did, or if I did. But I felt that same powerful grip on my arm. And I hear a voice 
just as I'm talking right now, says, David, don't do it. I still love you, man. And I shook my head. And I was like, okay. <laughs> All right. I kind of got pumped up for some reason. It's kind of weird. But um, so uh, my arm's back now. Take a deep breath and do it again. And that same and the room got real dark, really dark, really heavy. And Cody actually went into another room. And I'm, I'm tearing up. I'm crying. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I hear that same voice. But this time, instead of my arm being grabbed, with all my strength, I'm trying to hold my hand up. And my arm's sitting here doing this. And to this day, I remember the same feeling. My, I'm, I'm not the strongest person in the world. But I have enough strength to hold something in my hand. And if I'm determined enough, I'm going to keep it in my hand. But literally, my hand did this. And I could not move my hand. That room changed. The oppression went away. The same voice said, David, I told you not to do it. I've called you to a greater level. And in that state, in that moment, I realized how pitiful the situation was. I realized how broken I was, and I said, God, okay, I'll do it your way. And when I was preparing this message, I didn't really understand how in the world I'm going to close this out because, you know, we're stupid, we're tempted, we're oppressed, we're pitiful. That's a pretty sad sermon. I mean... You know, if a preacher got up every Sunday and said, you're stupid, you know, you're tempted, there's no way out. I was like, dear God, I cannot preach this. I'm like Pastor Jerry. I don't like to preach sad sermons. I like to be happy and preach about faith and love and joy and jumping around and shouting. Oh, Lord, that felt good. <laughs> now I know why you do it. <laughs> this pulpit is contagious. Oh, let me get down here. <laughs> I told you I never run in church. I might do it. Um, anyway, but I realized how in the world am I going to real, how in the world am I going to finish the sermon? <laughs> and back to my roommate, he and I, he loves to go to Walmart. He's fascinated by the idea that you can go to one store and get everything for really cheap. And everything in Australia is like three, three times more expensive. Like he, he got so happy that he could buy soft drinks for like four dollars a twelve for a twelve pack in Australia, it's like ten. I'm like, I thought it was expensive. I'm not moving to Australia, um, but we were at a red light. <laughs> Speaking of red lights, of all things, when I was writing the sermon, one one day I was kind of a little bit late to work, going a little fast, and I was behind a truck, big truck, couldn't see the light. And it turned red. And guess who's sitting right over here? An undercover police officer. Pulled me over. I got a ticket. $240. I am never running a red light again. <laughs> you sow and you reap. It's very evident. But that taught me to leave early. But when we were on the way to Walmart, and we got at a, a red light, and I stopped at this one. I didn't go through this one. And, and I'm sitting there, and I'm talking to him, and he's talking to me. And something you have to understand about people from Australia, they are very direct in how they say things. They are very boisterous people. Um, they are very, uh, I don't even know how a good way to say this. They're very pushy in when they tell you things. Not on purpose, but just they're always yelling. They're always yelling. So we're walking, we'll walk through Walmart, and he's talking to me, and he's yelling at me. 
He's not yelling at me, but he's just really, really loud. So you see everybody in Walmart looking at me and looking at him. We had one lady. Um, he said something, and she turned around and said, are you talking to me? He was like, no. And, and later on, in the same, the same lady, poor lady, I felt sorry for her. David was walking like this, talking his loud self. And she's walking towards him, and they're used to walking on the left side. Everything's backwards. They're driving on the left side, walking on the left side. And I'm walking on the correct side, the right side. And he's just walking, walking along, walking along. And he gets about that close from her face. And he looks up and says, oh! Again, in that Australian accent and she's like you were talking to me won't you <laughs> but um anyway when we got to the stoplight and nick if you'll make your way up here um when we got to the stoplight and it turned green he said david go and it hit me i said that's how i'm going to close it because stop Stands for stupid, tempted, oppressed, and pitiful. So the stupid me tempted me, pitiful me, and oppressed me. But when you put go in front of me, it's God ordained me. And if you take stop or put me behind each letter, it's so me, to me, owe me, or po me. But if you put it behind go, it's God ordained me. Because I'm thankful. I'm thankful that even though I mess up, even though I do wrong things, even though I struggle, God ordained me. He ordained me to live higher than sin. He ordained me. He called me to live in a victorious life. And when Nick was singing, I didn't even realize that all the songs were going to be talking about Jesus' name. And I, I actually told him, Daddy, when I was finishing studying for this afternoon, I said, Daddy, I never finished my sermon. I got to the God ordained part, and I didn't have anything after that. And it was not finished. I knew it wasn't finished. But God finished it sitting right here. And the the closing thought is this the fact of God ordained me to be able to use his name that's what God really ordained me to do to have the access to Jesus through Jesus to use the most powerful name in the universe to overcome my stupidity to overcome any temptation to overcome my oppression to overcome my pitiful situation it's his name that allows me to go when the world's trying to stop me. It's his name. And I don't really have an altar call per se because I don't feel like this is an altar call sermon. I feel like this is just a more of a, a sermon to let you realize and let you know That even though sometimes you get stopped in life, God ordained you that you can go. And whether there's five in this room or 5,000, I grew up with the thought that the more people I was able, would be able to preach to, the more effective my sermon would be. God checked me on it and Pastor checked me on it too. I'm thankful that he does that. Because we went to lunch one day and I said, Pastor, why is every church not big? Why does every church not have a large sanctuary and thousands of people running to get the gospel and get preaching? And he said, David, there's two reasons. 
when they get big, they lose God. And when they get big, the preacher gets distant from them. And it's all a show. So I would rather speak to one and then be saved and set free than speak to 5,000 and nobody's life be changed. And if nothing else, this sermon was for me. Because even this past week, during revival, there's been a situation and something that's going on, going on, and attacked me and attacked me. And Monday night I came, and I came to the altar. I don't know how long I was here. I, I don't even remember. Um, matter of fact, standing right here. Yeah, standing right here. And, um, uh, I've always heard that the altar is not a place of shame, it's a place of gain. But I didn't really realize it until Monday night. Because what I gained was not so much the answer to how to defeat the problem. I just gained the fact that the problem doesn't even exist in Christ. And I feel like this song that they're going to sing is called Holy Spirit. And it says, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. And I feel like somebody needs to be overcome by God's presence again. Maybe it's just me. I learned a long time ago that no matter how many times I have to get to the altar, I know that the altar is a place where it, things are changed. I learned the value of the altar because it's where you die and God lives. And as we stand and they sing this song, and we're closing out, tonight there's two groups of people in here that I hear God talking. There's the ones that feel stopped and the ones that feel like they can't go. You're not stopped by anything, but you just can't seem to go. This altar is open. I'm not giving an altar call. This altar is open if you want to be prayed for. This altar is open for anyone. And if you're in this room, perhaps, and you are not saved, or if you're watching by live stream and you're not saved, it's as simple as accepting Christ, believing that He died and rose again, and that He's the only way to God in heaven, and confessing with your mouth that He is Lord, and then living it, really living it. As a matter of fact, there's somebody in this room with every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not even going to call your name. I'm not going to call you to the front. There's somebody in this room, at least at least two people actually, that you feel stopped. You feel stopped in, you feel stopped in a family situation. You feel stopped in a family situation. As a matter of fact, it's a close family member. Whoever you are, the word of the Lord is this. God ordained you to be the one that changes the situation. So don't fear. Just do. Go. Because God has called you to it.
listen and see of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your prayer Somebody needs to make their way to the altar. I don't know who you are. I have no idea what you're dealing with. Don't miss the chance. Don't miss the fact that God is here. Somebody's miracle is waiting at this altar. Someone's miracle is waiting at this altar.